Madan Thangavalu runs engineering for the flagship rider app at Uber. Over 10 years, he's been a key part of expanding it beyond just rides. In this interview, he describes how developers can take data-driven applications far beyond analytics and the modern data stack. Madan, give us a little of your background, how you got to Uber, and how you came to be responsible for the rider app. Sure. Hey, George, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, I, I've been at Uber for almost 10 years now, so it's been a long journey. When I started, it was a very tiny startup and definitely has grown to running these millions of uh, uh, apps in so many devices across the world. So uh, I run our writer engineering team, which is responsible for the flagship app that you download. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've really transitioned from an app that's only an A to B travel app to an app that gives you so much more related to package delivery, renting a car, and now we begin even do a train booking. So the app complexity has definitely exploded over the last few years. Okay, great. And that's what we want to explore. Now, um, as I've said to you um, offline, a lot of the people, um, our audience is really familiar with lake houses and the modern data stack but they're moving towards being able to build apps like Uber and like what you've done. So one of the first things I was hoping we could go into is how, how Uber chose this separation of concerns between what's in the rider app and what's in the backend platform. Yeah, I, that's a very interesting question and that actually sets up the Uber app slightly differentiated from other apps. So typically a lot of apps are, you know, the user interacts with static content. So they are swifting through their, you know, uh, friends posts or whatnot. It's very high scale. But in the case of Uber app, that data that you talked about is very real time. So things that can happen on your app that somebody else changed. So the driver can cancel or your order is now ready. And all those updates are now happening on your app, which is completely distinct from somewhere else. That real-time nature is what sets the Uber app apart. And to your question about how do we separate this, the data, I think to start with, we need to think about what data the user can create, which is your app, like the location, your position, your interest, where you want to go, what you're tapping. And then there are things on the server that are data that the server knows before you know, which is, all right, like there's no cars in this neighborhood, or the, this driver canceled on you, or a driver got accepted. So we definitely try to do from an interaction standpoint, the person, the, 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 the system that has the data is the one that initiates. So a lot of data push comes from the server, a lot of uh, uh, app pushing the data to the server, these things happen. And from a separation of concern, we definitely look at where all these things have to come together, meaning the drive Uber driver app and the rider app cannot independently operate on its own data layers and, um, uh, microservices, they all ultimately have to converge because they have to meet together at the same time. So we can discuss more on how that separation is happening. Okay, so it sounds like because of the real-time nature of the whole system, not just the rider app, but the driver app, and the fact that you're you're matching real-time activities, that um, the the separation of concerns was very much driven by making sure everyone is up to date in, in real time. Exactly, yeah. And all your okay. offline data has to eventually also combine together on that single thread which where the interaction happens, which could be a trip uh, um, or something else. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about some of those enti entities like, like a trip, like a fair. Um, some of these things, I assume are common to both the say the rider app or the the driver app. If they're common, is that then something that get put gets put into a shared backend platform, and then that's responsible for making sure propagating the real time updates to the different apps. Definitely, I think there are some core entities like you mentioned, uh, the fulfillment order and the state and what's happening. Then there are systems that are on fares, which says, okay, who pays who and for what? There are pricing systems that determine how much to charge. So from a layer abstraction perspective, 
these fundamental microservice domains, so to speak. So there are domains which has multiple intra services, but they all represent fare. Multiple services that represent all the fulfillment states, which combine the driver states, rider states, uh, but that's a domain by itself. So there are these very core domains at, which are at the lowest layer. Then at the app level, very similarly, you will build libraries that are common and shared around, hey, these are the libraries that serve your fares and order states. And then you build your application code on top of those libraries on the app. So then this domain that's having the true state in the back end and that library that's kind of this SDK on the app, those interact to make sure that it's the same view for all parties involved. And then there's application code on top. So would it be fair to say that even if it's a backend microservice, um, it could be part of the writer app? In other words, we shouldn't think of the writer app just as presentation. There's logic in there. 100%. Like a, a, a driver canceling and you letting know a, dry, a rider that the cancel has happened, now a push has to be sent to the rider uh, when the driver cancellation happens. And then when you want to do an analysis post, that event from the earner or the driver app has to align with the fact that there was a message that was delivered to do BI or analysis or ML, and all that has to be stitched together. Okay, so let's just drop into for a sec how the how you implement some of some of this um, business process logic um, in microservices. Um, can you implement this in in different languages, different technologies, and that's just all hidden from the consumer of that microservice? Uh, yeah. So the, to do that, some some of the standardization, at least in, from the language perspective, we we have libraries in our Go. Golang and uh, Java. So these microservices that are at the bottom that are doing these data and uh, you know transactions, those libraries are not handed off as a as a transaction library. So the consumer does not say, "I want transactions across these things." They place very standard crystallized APIs saying, "I want to place an order, and these are my order parameters." Now, in the deepest system within that microservice is where we implement logic to transaction initiate, change all these entities, uh, and then close the transaction, make sure everything is uh, complying with each other. And we do some of the distributed transactions as well with entities that are not part of the same RDBMS. Okay, so this is... Um... This is interesting, and I and the reason I want to touch on this is again our our audience is you know growing up on just mostly analytics, and so this is where and and for for most of them all this um, all the microservices and the operational um, workloads are upstream, but but they're coming together. So so what you're saying is um, you're trying to relieve the transaction semantics and all the nuts and bolts of the transaction from the application developer of the of the app who's who's calling the logic and that's implemented so it's all that transaction logic is implemented in this base level shared service correct correct and that's what i, I think the the transaction logic and the onus of storing the data and keeping it accurate uh, the onus of emitting your automatic BI events, a lot of these things, if you keep it at the lowest level, then your layers that are above, which are multiple microservices sitting above, and even the app itself, can just assume that it's mostly stateless interacting with this common thing that will make sure that things are not cross-wired. So you don't have to do it all the way from the consumer of the app. So you have to think carefully about the base transactional services and then right. you're essentially insulating the upper level services from having to worry about transaction logic they just they just say right. do this and all the underlying logic and then therefore any errors or retries or compensation is in the lower level yes so the lower level has to inform what the user could do so as an example when you place an order Let's say that you're already on a trip and we don't allow you to take a trip. That 
the, 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 the fact that you will be prevented would be at the lowest layer, or you're trying to cancel a trip you're not on, that would be at the lowest layer. But that lowest layer has to inform those layers about to say, okay, this is the reason we want you, we couldn't take your trip or we had to cancel. Then that needs to propagate back to the app. The app has to then show a view that kind of corresponds to that. So in the case like a payment issue, right? So you're, you chose the wrong card that has expired. The app has to decide that, okay, for this error, I need to show you a pop-up that says, okay, can you want to switch your payment instead of just dropping the error on you? So the app has to understand the error semantics, but it doesn't have to worry that something wrong would go through through the system because that guardrail exists at the, at the lowest uh, part of the stack. So in other words, the the whoever's calling the transaction just has to understand the different states. Like it could go wrong. Right. This is what I present if it goes wrong. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So so then would it be fair to say that the the writer app, um, the writer app includes some upper level microservices that they and it just calls on the lower levels. Uh, shared services, and that's the backend platform, and that's how the Rider app. We shouldn't think of it just as this, you know, nice UI. The Rider app is Rider logic interacting with shared logic, where the shared logic could be um, things that the driver app also has to has to deal uh, to call on. Yeah, we definitely talk about this shared logic being in the backend systems. But there are also shared logic on the app layer, foundation layer. So there are libraries that will do your authentication or your accounts page. Like if you go to your accounts page in the primary Uber app, and if you go to the accounts page in the Uber Eats app, they look exactly similar. Because we've built, again, layers of a common platform in the app code, in the mobile code itself, that can basically serve these functionalities. Uh, payment profiles, again, very similar. You go to your Eats app, you go to your Rider app, they all have the same. So we've we've done a lot of like app level platformizations to share code. We've done a lot of these uh, back end platform level uh, standardizations to prevent these transactions in a single single place. Okay, so so for for the part of the audience that's used to dealing with you know analytic databases like a data warehouse or a data lake, what are some foundational services that have to call on both like a historical system of truth to inform you know with context but also have to execute a transaction what would be some examples and and how do you bridge those i'll maybe touch on two and maybe a third example that's very interesting to me um so let's talk about ai ml use case specifically Let's say you're on the app and we want to show you a card that says, you know, right now the, uh, the, the, the there is a lot of demand and then you should probably pick this uh, other uh, product or some, some recommendation like that, right? Now the request will come or the, the to this common system that's going to do the matching dispatching. But parallelly, we also need to make an inference whether we need to show that card. So there's, there's data in these transactional systems that can tell you whether you can have an order. Then there's an ML system that's this potential offline train model that you have to now incorporate with this data that you've got here in real time and then the previous, the model. And then you have to make the call whether you want to show that card about. And you don't have to show it every time. You may have to show it sometimes when the user is sensitive to that information. So that's where the ML piece comes. It's it's not like cut and dry. You're making, an int making choices of whether to show it or not. So imagine in this situation, the blend is such that the, the way Uber built some of these uh, ML inferences is the request itself is not carrying all the parameters because if you allow for that, you can make a mistake. You may not have all the historic data. Uh, or, so all that has to be pre-computed or computed in real time in these near real-time offline systems, so to speak, which is not your primary live hot database. But you need to take the features from the request, push it into this ML uh, inference uh, system that is going to have this near real-time pre-computed, your Spark or your other pipelines that keep it as fresh. So it is going to join between your newest feature that just came in with the newest feature that it just computed offline, 
create your input vector, and that is when that is what goes into the ML model that gives you that inference. So that heavily reduces the load for, say, me as a developer trying to interact with the ML system. And all I have to give them is a reference to the user, some marketplace state that comes from your hot DB, but the rest of the parameters are computed on the fly, and then works against the model. So this is where it kind of it blends in the you know the, the uh, real time and the uh, offline slash historic data. And so, what would be uh, that? Sounds like a, a pretty universal pattern that a lot of microservices would use. I assume that's the context it's used in. What yeah. What are some examples? So, in the, in the in the when when you say examples, are you thinking about uh, specific uh, product use cases, or are you thinking about uh, something different? Yeah, no product use cases. So, like someone, you know, like a so someone in the audience says, "Oh, this that's how this part of the app works." You know, where it's informed both by the real time context and the near real time that you were talking about, and and that you know maybe is how you personalize the feed or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. If you open the app, we instantly, for example, typically there is a button that says, "Okay, where do you want to go?" But right underneath it. Let's say you have a promotion. Let's say your account is starting to, uh, you know, expire, or we you've never taken a reserve trip, and we want to promote the reservation as a capability. So just at the moment when the home screen loads, we get your lat long, or your your app lat long. We have to send it to this backend system. That backend system is going to just have these two or three parameters. Then it's going to call out to the ML system, and the ML system is going to take your lot of your parameters that are near real time, like how many trips have you taken? Have you ever taken a trip in the last seven days? Have you ever taken the reservation as a trip? So it has to capture all that real time and then infer whether we want to show you this card that is trying to engage you into this concept of reservation of a trip. Now, let's say you do that and you do end up taking the trip. You get dropped off. Next second, you open the app and you want to do it again. We don't want to show you that reservation because you just did it. So, which means that all the data has to catch up, so that that card doesn't show up and look stale for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, all right. So, this is a great example. So, under the covers, um, which uh, now I'm thinking at the database level, you know, where are you where are you determining um, so the most recent state of of the trips? Where do you keep the history? And then, you know, what does the logic look like that stitches all that together and presents the right feed, you know, the, the right personalized view? Yeah, I, I think that stitching is very critical. So there are a few different techniques we use. Uh, one is when a request originates. Uh, this, is, this is very standard on the distributed systems backend uh, community where you would start adding a trace header to every call that happens. And then every system it interacts with has that trace ID. And then second thing we do in a customized way is we, we do create a session UUID for a user that is specific to the duration at which you use an app, say 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So now these IDs are automatically propagated to all microservices. They're automatically propagated to all logs and backend systems and these offline systems neural real-time systems. And then when you want to essentially combine and get a view of all these things, then these trace IDs and these session IDs will help you combine these data together to put together the big picture of, okay, for this session and trace, what happened on the driver side, what happened on the writer side, and then you get the full picture. And so underneath, I'm, so I'm just thinking, I'm just you know, at the plumbing level, level, are you using... Are you um, uh, like, like Spanner as Spanner your as well. um, transactional database are using streaming system to, to get the user maybe telemetry. Um, and then the historical context is in some lake house. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So the way we do that, you're right. We, we put our full, the, the trip state machine is entirely backed by Spanner. Now, in order to keep a copy of this, or historical context or offline analysis. At the nuts and bolts level, we have built frameworks. Think of them as ORMs or these state machines. And what we have done is at the, at the framework level at these state machines, we've created ways to emit events and metrics. So 
So no, an individual developer is not trying to keep these offline systems and these historic data in our warehouse uh, and our uh, you know, hive tables accurate. Instead, automatically as state transition happens, the framework ends up emitting these events and metadata into your Kafka and your, 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 your message bus. And from there, we have we automatically end up indexing that into our raw tables in uh, your hive, right? So that way, nobody. Uh, we did have a choice at some point to actually, really, you know, listen to events from Spanner. We've attempted it. We have not gone there yet. So instead, we do it anyway. It's a transaction anyway. All the data goes to that single choke point. So we're able to do that at the framework level. Okay, so that it's it's. It's at the logic that brings all those data systems together and is responsible for creating a, a sort of a coherent view. Correct. Okay. So um, we've talked about um, how you're abstracting the the transaction nuts and bolts by putting it into the responsibility of a low level um, uh, microservice. When you need to orchestrate multiple transactions. Like typically, we're typically people think of that as the responsibility of like a workflow orchestrator. Is that then just logic that's implemented in a like fixed logic that's in a like a microservice that calls other multiple other transactions? Yeah, in in the so typically people do these uh, in workflows. Uh, that's a but workflows are not a very well suited paradigm for a high throughput real time system like this and that's where we had to hand roll our our own ways of doing these transactions right and we had some versions and generations of this tech so I'll, I'll describe the first version of it and then i'll describe the more recent version in some of the first versions we would essentially have a number of workers have all the data in memory and we will operate across uh, by routing requests to the right worker, which has kind of a queue in memory, which means once everything is serialized, your, your transactions are easy. Because now once the three parties have to do the same thing, then in memory, you just have one buffer and you're just changing it in the sequence that came. That's kind of how it used to be about like two, three years back. And over time with Spanner and the abilities that it has provided, we've actually pushed some of the um, uh, serializing and transactionality further into the database. But once you want to do transaction across another system that has its own database, we've created this concept uh, of uh, a two-phase commit, even across, this is very typical in database uh, systems, but we were able to implement some of those at the application layer where these two services will be able to uh, uh, you know, operate and do that transaction or rollback uh, by implementing similar API patterns across services. Okay, okay, this is all interesting because these are things that you know more mainstream developers are going to have to face, um, and hopefully the the sort of rising tide of abstractions will make it easier. Um, so let's 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 dive into the writer app some more more directly. Um, now I know you and and Uber has published. Um, a lot about um, how this this app evolves very quickly, and and you talked a little bit about it at the beginning. How you know it started out as just matching you know a rider with a driver, and now there's a whole range of services. So talk about maybe how it's grown over time in in what you can do, and then how that had to be reflected in how you built the app. Definitely, I think about. Um... Five to six years back, we did some major re-architecting of the app. Prior to that, it was a very standard MVC development patterns, which is very common. You have your screens, you end up interacting, you, you have a model, and you have a logic that ends up determining what to show in the view. Uh, but as the number of engineers grow and as the feature sets grow, it is extremely hard to keep up. So as an example, when you land on the home page, one team from safety wants to pop up and say, hey, you're a verified driver. Another team wants to basically say, your credit card is expiring. Another team wants to say, I want to sell you a reservation as a trip and you know engage you in that. 
and then the user wants to take a trip. So you can see many things can happen in a single small real estate. Now, when, if you do just a plain vanilla MVC, then everybody, all these developers in different parts of the company, thousands of them across regions, time zones, they're all touching the same parts of the code, same files, uh, and then there is template, right? So a fundamental shift had to be done on how to have different frameworks that allow people to independently operate. So the mental model I would try to kind of draw uh, parallels to is instead of having a screen then clicking and going to another screen, Uber created new uh, patterns. Uh, and I'm not saying frameworks per se, I'm starting with patterns because uh, you want to compartmentalize each of these. The safety team that wants to pop up should write its code separately. Uh, somebody else wanting to show another card should write separately. But ultimately, they all come together as a single UI. And my mental model is think of it as a single page application where different pieces say, I want to show this on the view, but then there's a coordinator that ultimately takes it and determines uh, the actual rendering in view. So we moved from MVC. Uh, there are other patterns in the world, like the, the Viper frameworks. Uh, we had our own internal thing called Riblets, very similar to Viper, and it has a little bit of a less number of components. But the idea is single responsibility, isolation. In a single page, people build, should be able to build in isolation, but be able to operate multiple changes on the same view. So to be clear, it's sort of like the, the, application, the application you could think of as a screen, as a screen. and the components of the components app are responsible for responsible elements of the screen, of the real, screen estate. real estate. And then this riblet, um, I, don't, I don't know if frame, framework is the right word, is what is what composes everything and makes it work together. And that's then allows the writer app engineering team to work on features rather independently, almost like they're microservices. Exactly, exactly. And then the good part about it is you can take some parts of those ribs that has been built in the writer app. And remember, I talked a little bit about platformization. So the idea is because of these isolations where you, your component gets the data from the back end, your component tells a view what to render for just your piece, we can take parts of that and put it into your uh, Eats app. You can take parts of it, put it into your uh, driver app. So your logins are not rebuilt. They are platformized, and these are ribs. They are like microservices being reused somewhere else. Oh, so they can be composed differently. They're yes. not tied to the, the screen composition of the rider app. They really Absolutely. are. Okay, they really are logic. They are they are logic with a presentation that are reusable. Yes. To give you an idea, let's say you're on a home. That's a home rib, and within the home, you can have say two buttons. Each button could be its own rib uh, uh, node, which can it gets its own data. Which means if I want to move this button from here to move it somewhere, I just yank that part of the code and module and stick it somewhere else. So, all right, let's try and start um, tying some of this together. So with these ribs, like components within the, the presentation part of the writer app, would these ribs have their own logic independent of some of the microservices that the writer app um, manages on the back end? Yes, I think that's, that's the art and science of it because you cannot expose your back end uh, transactional models or business models as is. So very typical patterns, people will need some presentational models, which very directly speak to the UI layout. And then there are these domain models, which represent the deep core entities that are almost invariant. Uh, and there is a case to be made where you can, you, can, uh, you can make layers above these microservices to finally say, every presentation goes through only 100% presentation which means every domain will be trans translated and only presented. And Uber did some of this with some uh, layering where we have a presentation layer, we have a mid-tier, and we have these core models. But ultimately, where we arrived at is we can't only do presentation. Because remember, the interaction in a marketplace is two-sided, three-sided, or sometimes four-sided, which means all those entities have to be sent to a single app, regardless of whether that app owns that entity or not. So writer doesn't own only the writer entity. Driver data needs to come. 
So where, where we are is in a blend of there are presentational models and then there are entity models that are actually exposed directly in the app. But the app is very sensitive to not modify that, but as is use it from a read pattern, but it is free to do the UI rendering in whichever shape or form it, it, it deems uh, fit. Okay, so th this this is I, I want to drill into this a little more to make sure I understand this because this it sounds like this is how all the pieces come together. There's the back end, the the back end platform are the shared services that everyone needs to access, and and I assume I don't know lo location might be um, or 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 payment or an account or something like that might be a shared service that that everyone works on then there's what you were saying these domain domain models or entities um like for the rider app i i um maybe give us some examples of what are the domain entities that don't have a user interface but it, but the rider app calls on and then what are what are some entities that have a presentation piece that are in the app that we see on the phone sure thing uh, so think of ETA, for example, which is just the fact that your trip might have this much time to arrive. Or even before you're on a trip, if we show you that it'll take you three minutes to get a car. Now, those don't have heavy presentational uh, aspect to it. So those are domains. So from your uh, map system, it can give you uh, that information. Or route line, this is very standard. Hey, you put this in the map, right? Uh, or fulfillment state, the fact that the order is canceled. That's that's the domain model, which doesn't have a corresponding view as is, and the domain doesn't determine what the view is. But then from the presentation, we, we will typically send a UX that says, oh, we're sorry that your order got canceled. You might be charged $3 for that, or we, we give you $3 for the inconvenience. So that UI might have this dollar amount and the fact that it got canceled but it has to reference the domain model that came to the app to say that, okay, now that's canceled and hence I'm gonna show this presentation. And that presentation details and all the text over there, all the metadata over there, that's the presentation model that's sent separately. Okay, I think I'm, all right, so let me try and replay this and then you you correct me. So like a shared service, backend service might be um, something that's like the map of the city and that that service might calculate routes and and ETAs or or other services might call on that to calculate a route and an ETA and then the rider app might show in a presentation rib um what the ETA is and what the route is but the underlying domain um is is either the the back end service or the rider specific access uh to that service is that yeah. does that yeah it does the only the additional thing i would say is how you infer that data and what all you want to show in the ui need not be one as to one so the fact that it's a three minute eta is a source of truth from the domain and it passes through all the way from your backend systems all the way up to the app but then now that it is three minutes, how do you react to it? What are the components and metadata you want to show? Which is, hey, we want to show you a badge that says this is the fastest car. Now, the fact that you want to show that it's the fastest car, that data comes from another backend that is related to the rider only and its presentation model, which will have the string that says fastest car. But the, the blending of that data on the app will happen taking the domain data that's already arrived at the phone and then the presentation data that's arrived at the phone and it will merge them together. And and that merging is done on the device, on the, on the, device. On the phone. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we have references. So and, and the reason why you do this is the backend, and this is why I say the Uber app is unique, is a lot of these domain data change very fast. It's not static. So hence, the app cannot just keep going every time it wants to update the view. We push so much to the app, and then the app UI reacts to it. And if I, if the app says, okay, I want to update my UI, it gets more recent presentation data, but the domain data keeps coming to the app very often. Okay. So, so yeah, part of, 
part of what is so unique is that this is a real time system. And um, so, so tell us more then about where you could take this, you know, in the future so that it's, you know, it started out as get me a ride, but you know, it's more and more services. Like what was, what has to be um, in the architecture to allow that sort of, you know, adaptability and, and what are some of the things that we should think about, you know, in the future that we might be able to, to call on? Uh, I'll touch on two things. One is the interesting concept of observability when you have such high cardinality services in a app and how data relates to it. It's very important. And then second, I'll talk to a little bit of app UX architecture, which kind of starts to flex because there are so many use cases. Um, I'll touch maybe two minutes on the observability piece and then do the other part. So we... The, the app, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of things in the sense that in some regions in the world, Uber app might actually work as a negotiation in price. So you today in the U.S., you would look at a price, you press a button, you get it. Some places in the world, you might press it, the driver can counter and give you a price you might accept. In some cases, you know, you, you might be able to send a packet, so now you're having to put a pin to verify that you got the packet. So the complexity of the different A to B movement use cases is quite a lot. And there are at least 50 to 80 that I can out of memory spell. And obviously, there are more. And so now, how do you observe that all this is functioning properly? So when you say, where does this go? One direction where this will tend to is you don't know whether it's things are functioning properly unless you have good observability. But today, from the app, we have almost like a million events that are emitted every second that comes to our system, into our uh, warehouse, so to speak. And then we run very uh, active anomaly detection on that data. So let's say a single product in a single city somewhere because of a UI doesn't work properly. Then this entire pipe of data that comes from uh, that interactions on the screen and taps, and we need to find quickly that something is wrong. So that reliability and the observability is a big deal when you start growing your app into so many different dimensions and having that data pipe and the quick analysis system is super crit critical for, for our app. So tell, okay, so this is, you, you let on that there's an enormous data volume. Sounds like, I, th I think you said a million events a second from the global, yeah. global system. Um, so this is, this is no longer sort of, like someone in the back room trying to, you know, manage the system for, you know, say performance tuning sometime uh, every few weeks. This is how do you keep a real time system live and responsive? And I assume that it's almost like a, a, a whole different side of the, of the, a whole different set of applications themselves. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not like you store it. It's not only purely about sync this volume of data somewhere, later come back and analyze this. This is, you will have to react to the data that's coming, which means you have to have it near real time. And that's when you would determine whether, you know, the app is performing accurately in all these dimensions across uh, everywhere. So you have to have the most robust uh, system to actually get that data, even to get that data from the phone to the backend will be challenging because as a user puts the app on the background, as a user puts it to foreground, different things might happen and then you might have data loss. So obviously there's that. Then once it comes in, you have say five seconds to react to and build a point of view whether that kind of stream of events represent good functioning of the app or bad functioning of the app for that particular flow in the app. Uh, because nobody's sitting there watching this monitoring. These, these are automated systems that are going to then alert us. It looks like uh, package delivery in this particular thing on this version of the app starts to fail. And with microservices, Uber has like thousands of microservices. So one single system can take down, say, one particular version, which is not compatible anymore to the newest API changes in the backend. All that can be determined by this stream of data that's coming because that's your uh, eyes into what's happening in, in the real world. So, but it, it, 
it could also be that you could find a problem that it's not specific to a, a user's device and app. It could be a problem that's affecting many users um, and that you have to determine that. So this is, it's almost like, that sounds like you have the rider app, the driver app, and then you have a whole app to manage the system. Um, what what can you do in real time? How how does the system monitor itself in real time, and then essentially diagnose with enough confidence to remediate? I mean, that's a very hard problem for a system your size. Hundred percent. I I think just that we could be speaking for hours <laughs> because it's, it is complex. Uh, to just give you a quick sense, imagine the driver app not working. Okay, so nobody's able to accept a trip offer, which means no driver is saying, okay, I'll do a trip. The reflection of that on the rider app would be that people are creating orders, but they're not, they're not also on a trip. So sometimes your, your uh, issues might not be originating from your systems either. So it gets very complex. Uh, so the way to do this is you're gonna take these streams of data that are coming, you're going to add on certain dimensions to it that are deemed critical, whether it's city or app versions or Android, iOS, and things like that. Then you're going to pipe that into a uh, what we call like a real-time metric system. It could be we have an in-house system called M3, which is open source, uh, but there are these other purely numeric time series uh, ways of representing that uh, data for that particular dimension. Then you run certain uh, anomaly detection systems that constantly ingest this stream of data and start to predict whether it is matching, say, your previous hour to this hour, previous week to this week, some confidence band on what that expected change. And again, these are very time dependent and seasonal. Like morning 4 a.m., you won't have that many trips, but noon, 12 o'clock, you might have. And then in the case of eats, your lunch times and your dinner times are where the spike would come. So your system has to understand the patterns to kind of match and uh, alert on anomaly. And when the noise gets too much, then you will have to do some sustained uh, window to watch out so that you're not noisy in, in your in your alerts. But to do that, I mean, this is like this is to to do this autonomously. The system has to have some notion of you know, what is a problem? Um, because then it, it has to correlate. It's 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 not just, you know, the, the time series data coming off one device. It's, you know, data circulating or coming from all the different microservices. And then it's it's got to correlate that. that. That's like a really, really hard, I guess that's why you said we could talk about it for hours. <laughs> well, a quick TLDR, maybe it cannot tell you the root cause, but a system like that can at least point to the, the failure domain, uh, because uh, the, there are other things we've done where pretty much any of these, whether it's an event or a screen or a backend service, all have ownership in terms of or like there, there's a person or there's a team, there's a notion that this belongs to this domain. So we have all that metadata to essentially say, okay, if something gets uh, looks like an anomaly, then you can infer what's the domain that's closest to that and ensure that the folks in that system are able to come back and react to it. Okay, so this is really an alerting system for now. Yeah. Yeah. And then I assume the aspiration is to get it smarter so that it can do better at root cause analysis and then remediation. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so maybe that should be a topic for conversation number two. We go into... Um, you know how the how how the app can accommodate more services and and then how the back end can keep the app responsive you know and running at all times that that should be a great follow up yeah reliability and this whole topic is its own uh, yeah its own thing all right madan any anything that you think we should impart to you know the viewers again who are who are coming from the modern data stack, but who aspire to build apps like what you've built. Any par parting yeah. thoughts? The bridge between these systems are closing in more and more. And uh, what I foresee is uh, being able to build app experiences that are 
only possible by referencing large amount of data in real time. I think that hasn't fully happened yet. Uh, we, we, we get the best of it by some level of pre-aggregation or some level of ML model generation, which is kind of this pseudo fa uh, facade to kind of make it look like it is understanding your past and present and uh, looking up all this data. But I do expect as we bridge that gap of having access to a lot of the historic data, a large volume of data, it will start to play into the app experiences in a more direct way rather than an indirection, which is where the, uh, the systems are today as it stands in the, in, the, in the community. That's actually a fascinating thought because the, the ML model is pre-baked with offline data and you feed a little bit in in real time. But as the systems, as our systems and, and infrastructure technology, for instance, allows like very large, you know, storage class memory in, you know, columnar formats, we don't have to pre-aggregate it quite so much. We could do the real-time analysis on much larger data sets. And that's how you're saying then we can, we can um, at real time provide context that includes all, all, all the history without sort of semi-baking it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Food for our next conversation. Madan, thanks for joining us today. That was a real treat. Thank you, George. Pleasure to talk to you.